This episode is brought to you by adamandeve.com. For 50% off almost any item, a free gift, and free shipping, use promo code MULTI at checkout. I, I really do think that is like the definition of love is giving someone a space to really be to really be authentically themselves. But that also means authentic, letting them like really authentically fall on their face and fuck up and be a little child and throw tantrums and be like, I don't need to make this better. I don't need to improve this. I just I love you and I'm sorry this is happening. But this also isn't my shit to pick up. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating. If you enjoy sucking at communication. And you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships. Broaden your sexual horizons. Develop a better understanding of yourself. Or learn more about non-monogamy. Then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're talking about normal relationship and communication habits that are actually toxic and destructive. I wanted to say talk truck talk mm. structive. Talk structive? Yeah. I like that. We can make a little portmanteau out of it. Yeah. <laughs> talk talk structive. Yeah. I think the point of portmanteaus is to make two words even more difficult to say together. Yeah, definitely. That's what I've heard. <laughs> definitely. The purpose of them is to complicate the language and make it harder to understand and to say. Mm-hmm. So talk structive. Talk structive. Talk structive. Although I could see that it sounds like talking and being constructive. So I could That's also see true. it as like this is when you sit down and you have like a really productive talk with your significant other. You have a little mm, talk structive. Yeah, a little talk structive time mm-hmm. together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we are joined by my near and dear and very old friend. Okay, hold on. <laughs> he's, he's very old. Like, <laughs> I am literally the, the youngest person, person on we this call. associate ourselves with. <laughs> no. uh, my friend Ben Day. And Ben, do you mind introducing yourself? No, or? I'm Ben Day. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so you um so we're also kind of coaching buddies as well because yeah. in the la- last few years we've both gotten into doing coaching. We have different niches for sure, but what in particular is your focus when you're working with clients? Well, today uh, I just sort of came up with the term of a of a side hustle specialist basically. Um my goal is to hmm. help People diversify their streams of income, work in uh, areas that they're more passionate about, um, and live a life that's more on their terms. So I help people launch important side projects, monetize them, um, and get more in control of, you know, what they're doing, who they're doing it with, where they're doing it, when they're doing it, why they're doing it. Um, So, yeah. So basically, this is an episode of multi entrepreneur. No, 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 I was going to no. say before yeah. our listeners are like, branded it. What? That was it. <laughs> branding is it. Before our listeners are like, what? Like we're talking about side hustles on the podcast now. No, um, I'm I'm a side hustle guy. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, you. yeah. Ben today is a side hustle guy. Um, but you also you um are in a non monogamous relationship yourself. You don't need to go into intense detail about that if you don't want to. Um, And we have a relationship history together in ancient, ancient history, like 200 years ago or something like that. (laughs) (laughs) Like I said, he's very old. Hundreds of years. He's very, very old, man. Um, Anyway, but we just... good for 230, though. (laughs) Exactly. Um, But we thought that we would have a little roundtable discussion about... um, It's particularly inspired by this article that Mark Manson put out. And we've talked about Mark Manson stuff before on this show. um, About some really common patterns that you might see in relationships, behaviors you may see in relationships or communication patterns that are actually quite normal. I think a lot of people do these things, but they may be, as Jace put it, talkstructive (laughs) for your relationships. Yeah, I would I would clarify that these are things that not only are they normal, meaning commonplace, but they're actually things that I have definitely I can think of examples of all of these where they've been presented as being positive, as being romantic, not just normal, because we all are like, yeah, there's normal things I do that are shitty, but like that these are thought of as romantic or as good Mm. and that actually they're very destructive and toxic Mm. or destructic. Yeah. Is okay. All right. Okay. That. That's better. I think that's closer. He's making all the words. I do think today. that's closer. Um, I will say that these days, when so what I like to do when I'm on a plane, for instance, and I go through the film selection, I like to revisit old classics that I haven't watched in forever because I'm like, when am I actually going to watch this in my day to day life? Like, may as well while it's here and I don't have to hunt it down. And 
I've kind of stopped doing that because I've realized now revisiting a lot of films from like the 80s, 90s, even the early 2000s, I'm just like, there's some really problematic, uncomfortable things around sex hmm. and consent and relationships. And, I, and it's like maybe a little bit funny, but it really is does not hold up well. Yeah. Like what exactly? Oh, well, okay. A couple examples. Well, first of all, the three of us watched First Night not too long ago. I think we talked about that on the last episode um, where there were definitely things where it was like, oh, Richard Gere, you're just like really not respecting this woman's boundaries. Like this woman clearly said no to you like six different times and in six different ways. And you're still like, whatever, like you're still going to fall in love with me and do me. And that was sexy in the film it was Mm -hmm. painted as romantic and it was painted as like yeah she really did want it this whole time and her nose were i guess just meaningless yeah i mean we see the same thing in music is what i was gonna say it's like Mm. i've talked before about you know that parental warning label that gets put on cds not that anyone has those anymore but you know that parental warning label about like language or adult content or violence or something on cds I've said for a long time now that I think we should have that label, but for like warning, this CD contains toxic relationship models (laughs) and representations like super codependent or very controlling Mm. or telling another person what they want rather than listening to them or, you know, that kind of stuff. I just, um, a few months ago, Alex and I revisited Miss Congeniality, um, which... Oh, gosh, I haven't seen that in I years. I will say it was still very, very funny. Michael Caine, still very, very funny. However, there was so much where Michael I was like, Caine. this is like a terrible workplace environment where everyone's being like all the women are being harassed and objectified. Mm. And we just kind of play it off for laughs. There was definitely a lot of that where I was like, ooh, a lot of this humor just really doesn't hold up anymore. Yeah. What about you, yeah, Ben Day? Any yeah. recent 90s films that you've revisited <laughs> that made you uncomfortable? Um no, not as such, but I do want to piggyback on what you said about First Night and Richard Gere. Like we, you know, I hope this isn't giving away the game, but um, we have sort of a list of several behaviors that we're going to talk about. But one that isn't on the list, but that you just brought up is like this idea that persistence on a man's part is like salutatory and mm-hmm. is a sign. Mm. It's, it's, it's like it's, he's it, really into her. Yeah. And yeah. it kind of reinforces the whole like nice guy mentality, which mm. conjures up the word incel in my mind. And that's a whole separate conversation. Mm-hmm. But like this idea that, you know, I saw this great meme once. It's like the Morpheus meme where, and it's like, what if I told you? And it, and it, and it was Morpheus. And he was like, what if I told you that women aren't machines that you put nice guy tokens into to get sex out of? And I think, and so that idea of persistence really reinforces that idea of like, look, if I'm just like, if I'm just a quote unquote, nice guy, mm-hmm. which is kind of a false paradigm because you're not, you're just doing nice things, but you're not being a nice person. Mm -hmm. Um, then this person Mm -hmm. will suddenly like change and kind of bend to my will. And like, speaking of speaking of like toxic habits that people are told are healthy. And I had a guy tell me once I, I asked a girl out on a date and I told him and I was, and I was like, dude, she said she had a boyfriend and he was like, you sure she had a boyfriend or was she just saying no in a nice way? And I was like, Oh shoot. So I, it doesn't matter. I, right. And it doesn't matter, but I was too young and stupid. So like I went back mm. the next day and I asked her out and of course it didn't go anywhere cause she had a freaking boyfriend, <laughs> but like setting that precedent of like, no, no, you can sell anyone into mm. being with you. You just didn't try hard enough. Like right. that's dangerous. That's dangerous for everyone in the game. Right. You know? It wasn't like the Yeah. Or the idea like, yeah, if you're not married, then you can like still maybe go get them. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people, I've heard that trope, like, even from, gosh, like, people uh, who are a little older, like my parents' age or grandparents' age, like, well, you know, if they're not married, then you never know. You might be able to be with them. It's still not too late. Or something along those. Exactly. Is this kind of a Queen Bee, like, you should have put a ring on it situation? (laughs) Maybe a little bit. A A more recent, I guess still not that recent, example is the movie Dodgeball, which is a hilarious movie and a lot of people really like. But even at the time watching that, and it came out in like 2005, I think, 2004, 2005, even at the time I was like, oh, I see. So this is a movie where both the protagonist and the villain sexually harass this woman until she eventually chooses the good guy. 
And it was very wow. much that idea of like, she was not interested in either of them. And they both just kept hounding her and persisting. And the one guy, I guess, did it in a better way. And so therefore he's the good guy and we should root for them to be and together. that guy was Ben Stiller. Was ben, Stiller ben Stiller was the bad guy. <laughs> was, I think it was oh, Vince Vaughn. Then never mind. Yeah. 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 Vince Vaughn. Yeah. yeah. Vince Vaughn was the one who harassed her better than yeah. Ben Stiller did. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, it's not so, even something that we can be like, yeah, the 90s, right? But like, <laughs> No, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Very recent films as well. So another example of this that I think we not only see pretty frequently in pop culture, but we also see, I, I think, just in general culture, not even the pop side of culture. Um, and it's this idea of buying your way out of relationship problems. And apparently my father did oh, this Oh, really? A lot. What did your father do? What's the goss? Oh my What's god! The tea? Like, well, it was mostly my mother. So, my mother, when she met my father, wasn't like particularly wealthy, but my father was an orthopedic surgeon in the nineties or the eighties, I guess, and that I guess at the time garnered a lot of money. But he, you know, helped her with a down payment on a house and helped her buy like a big bedroom set and a bunch of random shit. But apparently, every time. They would get together. He would be like, did you like, you know, don't you love that watch I gave you? Isn't it gorgeous? Mm-hmm. Isn't like, you know, just kind of along those lines of talking about the thing over and over and over again and bringing it up when shit was bad and stuff like yeah, that. So I, I, think, uh, I posted yeah. about this on my social media a while ago, but I was in a relationship once mm. where, gosh, when it became clear to this person that I wasn't going to be monogamous with them, mm. that I very much wanted to be non-monogamous, he was like, oh, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have paid for your ticket to Disneyland. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, which, okay, it wow. makes me laugh now. Yeah. At the time, it, it felt real bad, yeah, as I'm sure I'm you sure. can imagine. Were you like, what in Where the I was world, like, okay, bro? so my monogamy is worth what? 90 like bucks? 90 bucks or something? No, like $110. Yeah. Well, at the time, I think it was like maybe. 90 bucks or something yeah. like this that. This was a few was years like, ago, yeah. Oh, that's what my monogamy is worth to this person. Wow. Um, which, I, I was so young and so silly and so innocent that now me would have been like, bye. <laughs> but back then, me was <laughs> like, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. So I, I feel like that's... Both of those examples make me think more of like the the courting phase. And that's something yeah. like Dedeker's talked about before is like, she's very hesitant to, if she's dating a man to let him pay for stuff, because from experience, mm. there's that expectation that later on, there's going to be some reciprocal for that, whether it's your monogamy or just maybe like adoration. Like it sounds like Emily, your dad might've been going for there or, you know, like I, yeah, I better be praised probably. for this thing. This wasn't just out of the goodness of my heart. I do expect. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's transactional. Right. Yeah, literally. I very rarely had an experience dating a man where if he paid for, let's say the majority of things, and I'm not even talking like close to 100%, I'm saying like more than 50% of the time. Um, like I very rarely had an experience where there wasn't some kind of strings attached or when the relationship turned sour or he disagreed with something that I did that that didn't come up as as leverage in some kind of way of like, I've contributed Mm. all of this and how dare you act in this particular way. Yeah. So, but to clarify though, that in this example, we're also talking about when you like, after you're in that relationship, like say you're, you've been dating for a while and it's like, we're not getting along as well or whatever. We want to buy ourselves out of that. So uh, this is really actually timely. I literally just had an experience with this last night. Um, No, you uh, bought your way oh, out of some relationship problems. Well, like, and so it, it's funny because I really felt like I was doing the right thing and it really like smoothed over the situation. And none of this is meant to be like an indictment of who I'm dating or anything. Cause I don't think that they were saying anything unreasonable, but this seems like a really good opportunity to have like three experts weigh in on this. And oh, maybe dear. this is a good talking point. For, I'm not, I'm not trying to get coaching, but I'm like, okay. yeah, other people are probably going to do this. So like, because the, the thing that came up was like, Hey, I feel like, um, I feel like I have been, you know, I've allocated resources. This is my, my partner speaking. I feel like I've allocated resources to like doing special stuff for us the last couple of times. And I miss that you used to do that a lot. And I'm, I'm 
you know, transitioning between jobs. And so money has been a little bit, my budget's been a little bit tighter. Um, but I also still made this trip to, to, I, I live in Portland and I made a trip up to Seattle. And so, you know, they, they were mentioning like, I'm feeling a little bit put out, like you're willing to put this money in this one place. And I just wish you would, this was the specific thing. Like, I wish you would take me out to dinner or whatever. Mm. I missed that. And I was like, Oh, well mm. shit. Like, what do you want? And then I bought her dinner. And I just was like, oh, you wanted this? Let me just handle that because this is, you know, um, and it 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 really kind of flipped the script really quickly where it was like, oh, you wanted this thing? Great. Let me do it for you because the money, the money wasn't a huge issue. Um, so but now I'm I'm hearing about this today and I'm like, oh, shoot, like, did I just did I just accidentally but- buy into a toxic thing? So. I don't I don't think so. I think in that scenario, like you had an honest conversation with a person and they told you about something that they wanted and you were able to give that to them. And as you just said, like it wasn't any skin off your back. And also it was just a thing like, hey, like, thank you for being honest with me. Like, you know, that's something that potentially you can work on in the future or whatever. But in that moment, I think you gave the person what they needed. And hopefully that did make them feel okay. It's not as though like shit's getting real and you're like here let me try to take you out to dinner a necklace you know kind of thing it's a different scenario i think i think you you were totally fine there Uh, yeah i think what this example is talking about specifically is when money is not the topic that's being discussed and it's like we're actually Mm -hmm. having a fight about the fact that like what you know whatever it is we're switch we're nickel backing (laughs) on something we're switch right or or like it's like that Sorry, you don't know the yeah, reference, I, I Ben, but, but we'll explain it. later. No but problem. we do. Our listeners hopefully do. Gosh, yeah. Also, I'm sorry to the ones who who don't go back and listen to some old episodes. Yeah. But, but anyway, the the point is that you're arguing about something else completely different, where it's like saying, you know, we're arguing about I don't feel like you love me or like you don't um, you don't seem mm-hmm. like proud to be around me when we're with your friends or, you know, kind of whatever it is, some other topic and then the solution is I buy you a car mm-hmm. or, uh, or I buy us a vacation Whoa. Right. <laughs> or which I guess to go with our theme of movies makes me think of 10 things I hate about you when he buys her that guitar at the end um, of the movie to like make up for the fact that he originally started dating her. Cause it was a bet that someone had made with him yeah. I see. and okay. that her, you know, her line at the end, they make it kind of cute where she's like, you know, you can't just buy me a, guitar every time you screw up and he's like yeah but i figure there's a bass and a drum set and maybe a tambourine eventually Mm -hmm. you know so he kind of makes a thing out of it but that is yeah that it's just Mm -hmm. like buying something to make up for something rather than actually fixing it screwing up rather than actually talking well i want to go just a tiny bit deeper on that one because i think that this can also be not necessarily about just one person buying something for the other but i feel like i see this with a lot of people where sometimes it's like we always need to have something big and exciting on the horizon to make the relationship feel like it's moving forward or like it itself is exciting. And that can be things either like as soon as we start to feel bored or uncomfortable, we plan a trip or as soon as we start to feel bored or uncomfortable, we decide to get married or then it's going to be a kid. And then it's going to be like, Oh, let's find a house or let's move to a new house or things like that. Like I've definitely Mm -hmm. seen that. And just the whole dynamic being that, some kind of material or external thing is being used as the replacement for confronting what the actual relationship issues are. Yeah, yeah. totally. Do we want to move on to the next yeah, let's the next one here? Okay, yeah. so this next one, uh, for listen of our, listeners of our show, they're going to be like, mm-hmm. And that is displays of loving jealousy. Mm-hmm. That loving is in quotes, Ooh. if you couldn't tell from my <laughs> voice acting mm-hmm. there. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Ben, do you have any, uh, examples? Of <laughs> how this? have you done this like one? In your yeah, own how life have you fucked up in, in this way, Ben? Holy shit. Like, <laughs> I, I don't mean that example. Exactly. Just like, it, can you give examples, like any arbitrary example of like what this might look like? You know, um, I, I, I don't feel like I have very many top of mind, but I've also like, the relationships wherein I was dealing with a lot of jealousy, um, like I haven't really dealt with that very acutely for a couple of years, but I remember mm. when, when you say that it does make me think, I don't, and I don't know if this constitutes loving jealousy. I don't know if our air quoted, um, adjective there counts, but when I was in 
I, I, I knew that I liked being with multiple people at a time back when I was like 15, when I first, when I first wow. like got into like spending intimate time with people, I was like, oh, this is great. We should all do this with everyone <laughs> all the time. This is a blast. Um, and, yeah. uh, and, and then I started dating someone and of course I'm like 16 and she's like 17 and you don't, you don't even know that you don't Going even know multi-amory exists 17. at the time. Polyamory exists yeah. at the time, but uh, on brand right there. <laughs> um, and she would get super jealous. I, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't cheating on her or anything, but I like, I had female friends I was close with. I had female friends I was flirty with and stuff. And she was, I mean, she would mm. just like little teapot boil right over. Um, and we had a lot of big talks about it. And so I'm like, in a way, I don't know if that counts as loving jealousy, but it's sort of like, I know that you, there's like this, this territorial nature and this feeling that like, if I'm not all for you, then I must not love you or respect you or whatever. Mm. Um, and that, that messed me up for my whole relationship trajectory. I'm still working on some of the, some of the huh. stuff that that did to me. Um, does, does that fit the wow. prompt? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cause it I does. think well, my then. entry point to it is a little bit on the opposite side that my experiences early on in some of my first formative relationships was more that if a partner of mine didn't display jealousy, I would be really anxious and mm. would feel like they must not mm. actually care. They must not actually love me. And again, it's not like I was going out trying to stir up jealousy or things like that. But it's like the fact that a partner was like, oh, you're going to go hang out with like with your male friend to, like alone for however many hours that I've, and I've never met this person and don't know like, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, and I don't know, maybe my partner at that time was experiencing jealousy, but just not expressing it. I don't know. But I remember feeling like, oh, he has no problem with this. That must mean he's like checked out of the relationship or he doesn't care, which I think mm -hmm. is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, when I was in my very first relationship, uh, this person it would say things like, well, you know, I saw a Silver Beetle, which was the first car I ever had, you know, on Oracle and Grant at three o'clock in the afternoon. Like, where were you? Who were Jeez, you Matt with? Lock. And stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. And it was definitely one of those relationships where at the time, like, you know, I thought I was going to marry this person. And my mom was like, maybe you found the one really early and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, in reality, he was super awful and abusive at the end. But still in the moment, yeah, it did feel like, well, maybe I should be relaying this information or or even if I don't recall being on Oracle and Grant <laughs> at 3 p.m., like I, you know, it means that he cares about me because he's looking out for that or something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it does, especially as a young person, I think it's really difficult to not conflate like jealous feelings with feelings of love or caring deeply enough about a person that you really like, you know, want to know what they're doing and where they are at all times. Yeah, like it almost bleeds over into like controlling this and like a desire to control you is how I, I mean, show that I love absolutely. you. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I actually wanted to kind of ask, I was realizing I was a little unclear what we were talking about, because when I think about jealousy, I have I have certainly had experiences of being extremely jealous, but I always experience mm. it as personal insecurity and mm. feeling like I am less than or not worthy or what's wrong with me. So I was trying to understand what is this idea of loving jealousy, but like, is loving jealousy just, uh, just like almost a cute way of saying being really controlling and manipulative. <laughs> I don't know. I think there's a spectrum with okay. these things because I think yeah, the there's spectrum a spectrum of quote still... unquote loving jealousy. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. It's like people that I know of where, I don't know, like I know some people who like think it's kind of cute when their partner gets like gets a jealous, little bit yeah. jealous when they're hanging out. <laughs> or like that guy was looking at you in the bar like, I, I'd love to kick his ass. Like how dare he? You know, versus I know, which definitely also makes me be like, <laughs> or but, but those things you know, are not <sighs> abnormal. Those are actually very normal behaviors for a lot of no, people. Totally, and yeah. I think most people would look at that as romantic. It's like, oh, that's how I know he really cares about me because he wants to fuck up any guy who looks at me the wrong way. Or I, OK, well, I will say I don't know if most people I, I think I think most people have a. There's a there's a line, right? Because I think even if even if you're very traditional monogamous, even in that context, someone who's extremely jealous and controlling really sucks, you know. 
I do think there's mm. a line. I do think it's a problem that any jealousy can be seen as romantic or as a sign of love. Like, I think that contributes to that. But I, I don't think that I would necessarily say that most people would think that, like, your male partner wanting to beat up any guy who looks at you as unequivocally positive. I think some people would, but I don't think most people would. But I think that the people... Yeah, I think you're right. The people who do think that there's no hint of being aware that that's weird. It's like, no, that's very romantic. And that's how this goes. Because mm. I, I always, I know I come back to this a lot on this show, but that's what we see in our movies and in our that's plays, true. you know, and mm, in fucking yeah, Shakespeare, yeah. that asshole who ruined relationships for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Contributed nothing to the human race. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, okay. Okay. Bullshit, bro. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Thank you. I was hoping someone could quote some Shakespeare better than me. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's uh, like, I think that a lot of narratives, like people who are like, oh, I'd, I'd kick the ass of any guy who looked at you or whatever. Um, it reinforces these ideas that love is equal to possession. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. no one can look at you because mm -hmm. you are mine. You are not, you are not your own being. You are my property and therefore I will defend my property. And that sort of gets like semi conflated into honor. You know, oh, I'm I'm mm. defending your honor, but in reality, you're basically just defending your own keep, mm. which still is. Mm. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, which still is like, you are you are mine, and I will protect you from invade. I will protect me from invaders, mm. which sets up really nasty competition dynamics between people, and we're not able to collaborate, and that's a whole other thing. But yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely a well worn path. So let's move on to the next one, which is blaming your partner for your own emotions. Um, I'm going to get into this a little bit more uh, in a in a later episode for sure. Oh, like like a little teaser talking here. about feelings and facts and stuff like that. But yeah, this is an interesting one for sure. Uh, and and that like this is a normal relationship behavior. But yeah, I think it's normal in a lot of ways. Like people will deflect. People will say like. You know, I'm having a really intense emotional experience and it's because this person did this thing to me. And, you know, my emotional experience is valid and fine and stuff like that. And I mean, yes, emotions are valid, but it's a question of whether or not this is actually a thing that like, do you know the whole story? Are you just like having your cognitive biases sit there and tell you that this thing is happening and that therefore you should be angry about it? What do y'all think? Well, so my experience of this in relationships, and first of all, I will say uh, I've definitely been a really bad offender of this in many relationships. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I think the way I've experienced, yeah, all the way I've experienced this in relationship is, let's say, partner comes home from work, has had a bad day at work, is in a bad mood, and kind of just this unwritten, unspoken expectation of like, well, your job is to make me feel better right now. And yeah. it falls along mm. this very fine line because it's like in relationship, yeah, if you come home after a bad day at work, it's like you do want to seek the comfort and reassurance of a partner, you mm -hmm. know, like there's definitely nothing wrong with that whatsoever. I think where it gets toxic is that it is this kind of unspoken assumption of like, if I'm in a bad mood and you're not doing anything to fix that, then we're going to have problems. Well, it's like that it means you don't care about me. Right. Rather than it could mean any number of reasons why you might not be noticing that or why you're not reading my mind the way that I think you should. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're not mind readers. Exactly. Like that. I <laughs> it's difficult because on the other end as well, you can sit there and be like, well, shit, like they're being terse with me. So clearly, like they hate me right now or upset mm -hmm. with me. And I don't know what I did wrong. And I'm worried don't about that. that. And so on the other end, it just can be these two people sitting there wanting something from their partner and not being communicative about it. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. This has made me think of several things. The first of which is if anybody wants a good resource on how to, um, like develop better skills around this. If you feel like this is your own, one of your own areas for growth. Um, I'm sure that y'all have talked about Marshall Rosenberg and nonviolent communication. Yeah, we um, have. Yeah. Marshall Rosenberg is like the father of nonviolent communication, basically for, to my understanding. And there's this amazing, um, it's like a three hour long YouTube video, but there are shorter versions of it where he just, he just does, he just takes you to school on nonviolent communication, hmm. on owning your own stuff, mm -hmm. on understanding that your reactions to things are not inevitable. I think a lot of people think that like when they have an emotional response, if they don't understand 
what they've done to contribute to that. They're like, well, how could anyone feel any other way? Anyone in this situation would feel mm. this way. And it's like, no, mm. you just feel this way because, you know, maybe because you didn't do your own emotional due diligence to make sure you didn't feel this way. So, I mean, he, he, he holds people, he holds people's feet to the fire and he'll call people out and be mm. like, nope, sorry that you're actually not owning your shit right now. And mm. I'm going to teach you how, um, and on the other side of it, what, what you two were talking about with like, you you know, my partner comes home, they've had a terrible day at work, and they're looking to me for some form of comfort or something like that, but I'm not in a space where I can necessarily do that. Or even I am, but I'm not a mind reader, and mm -hmm. I'm not, I mean, and also, like, their emotions yeah. are not my responsibility, right. ever. It's not my, it's not That's my job. absolutely true. It's not my job. I don't think it's anyone's job to make their partner feel better, because you can't, actually. Mm. You just can't, so don't put that on yourself. I heard, I think it was Rainer Maria Rilke, um, someone, or some great poet I love was talking about the idea of love and they said that like the real definition of love is two people holding space for each other i think that's literally the quote that we used a couple, Just a couple weeks ago, ago. Oh, yeah. i've always loved that because it really i i really do think that is like the definition of love is giving someone a space to really be to really be authentically themselves, but that also means authentic letting them like really authentically fall on their face and fuck up and be a little child and throw tantrums and be like I don't need to make this better. I don't need to improve this. I just, I love you and I'm sorry this is happening, but this also isn't my shit to pick up. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think I definitely... That's a really hard thing to yeah. do, but yes. On the other side of it, I think like what Emily was bringing up that, you know, a partner, again, we'll use the same example, partner comes home, really bad mood, bad day at work, um, that on my side, if I'm receiving that, sometimes even unprompted that then suddenly I'll get all this anxiety around like, oh God, I need to do something. Oh God. Then I yes. end up projecting on them. You mm, know, like totally. I can totally and it's just this yes, like cyclical And I can totally bullshit. project on my partner of like, well you came home doing this and saying this and, and acting like this and then that made me anxious and now it's all about me and my problems and now I'm also not taking ownership of my wow. shit, you know. And yeah, like Emily said, it becomes like this cyclical thing of us just kind of like throwing our emotions on each other and no one actually taking any yeah. GD responsibility. It GD. Well said. <laughs> it, this this actually reminds me, I, I feel bad about bringing this up again, but so on the meditation retreat that uh, Dedeker and Emily and I went on a few weeks ago now, one of the things they talked about, and this is a, a common theme in a lot of Buddhist teaching, is this idea that like you don't know what anyone else's experience is. Mm -hmm. No matter how much you might mm -hmm. think you do, you don't. Um, and so, you know, the, the example I think was in that Buddhism for beginners book. The example is someone cuts you off in traffic and you get really angry and you're like, why the fuck would they do that to me? This asshole, they're so selfish, they're whatever. But the truth is you don't know why they did that. You know, the truth is maybe, yeah. you know, maybe their <laughs> wife is, you know, in labor in the back seat and they're trying to go to the hospital. I know that's a cliche example, but, you know, say it's that or say it's because they just got fired from their job and they're having a bad day and they're so in their head that they're not even thinking about anything else that you just don't know. Maybe, maybe they're an asshole, but it really, it doesn't matter. Like the point is that the only thing you have any control over is how you react to it and kind of what you do with the situation rather than, um, you know that. So I guess it's kind of the same thing of this example, even just with our intimate partners. Like even if we learn to do that with strangers, sometimes with our intimate partners, it's harder. So much harder. Because it's like, no, but they should know. Yeah. They should mm. just know this. Or or oh, I yeah. think I know them so well. So I just know why they're doing this or what they're thinking. Oh, exactly. You know? And it didn't you say that or or I thought that we talked about that that like actually as you as you go further along in a relationship, you actually know your partner less than you think you do just simply because your own cognitive biases surrounding them, like permeate yes. most of what you actually think about them and their actions towards yeah. you. I think that is really, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a really good thing to think about when dealing with your partner. And yeah, God, I just want to say like, I've used that Jay's uh, that you were talking about, um, in uh, working at a restaurant the because there are a lot of people who are oh. in bad moods at restaurants yeah. and yeah. you take it personally in the moment and you're like, wow, what a bitch. But honestly, like you have no idea what's happening. Their parent could have just died like anything, anything. And so just like kill them with compassion, not kill them, but love them with compassion, <laughs> yeah. love them with kindness, you know? 
Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Hey, y'all, I want to take a quick moment to talk about adamandeve.com. Um, to be totally honest, there's a soft spot in my heart for adamandeve.com because, first of all, I don't know if you know this, but they've been around since before the internet. Like, the company's been around since before there was even a .com to attach to their name. <laughs> it was just I'm Adam and Eve sure, then. Yeah, How yeah. Far I'm pretty it's sure come. if I think back, they were probably the first website I ever ordered a sex toy from. Oh, ever wow, as, wow, like yeah. they were around before amazon was around and before any other number of like competitors were around so they go way back um so if you go to adamandeve.com you can find all kinds of wonderful things whether it's sex toys or lingerie or pornography or lube or condoms pretty much anything you could possibly need for sexy times and the best part is that if you go to adamandeve.com and if you use our special promo code which is multi m-u-l-t-i then you can get 50 percent off pretty much any item in the store they will send you a free gift along with your order and they'll also give you free shipping and my favorite part this promo code can be used multiple times as well so Anytime you need to buy that sexy thing, the lingerie, the condoms, that sex toy that's really expensive but you've been wanting for a long time, if you want to knock 50% off of that price, plus get a free gift, plus free shipping, use promo code MULTI at checkout. So let's talk about Patreon. Patreon is an amazing community of people that we have kind of compiled over the years. Um, but honestly, you have just all come to us and it's been so wonderful to get to meet um, all of our patron members. So when you become a patron at the $5 level, you become uh, part of our private Discord chat server and our private Facebook group. But then if you go to the $7 level, you get access to weekly bonus episodes and ad-free versions of our episodes. And then you also get them a day earlier. So all of those things are super great. Um, bonus episodes, something that's kind of near and dear to my heart because I know we all get a little bit more into personal stories uh, from each of us. I tend to cry a lot on them. So if you want to hear more of that, then <laughs> definitely true. tune in. Um, there's also things like extra questions for guests that we have on the show and then just even more in-depth information on the topic that we talked about um, during the show. So we would love it if you joined us at patreon.com slash multiamory. We love our patrons so much. We've learned so many amazing things from them about things that they want to hear about on the show, uh, even just like giving us a community in a way that we never even thought was going to be possible when we started this show. But it's huge, and it's become such an amazing resource for us as well. So if you want to be a part of all that, and we would love you to join, again, go to patreon.com slash multiamory. And another thing that would actually help us a ton, if this show is something that you like, is to take a moment, maybe right now, and just go to iTunes or Stitcher and write us a review. Um, we have so many amazing reviews from our listeners, and it, I know it, it can sometimes seem like it doesn't matter, but it actually does. It makes a big difference, especially for podcasts that aren't owned by PRX or NPR or one of these huge companies. Like for us, like independent podcasts, those reviews are what make us show up in search results at all, basically. Not even just a hire, but show up at all is the fact that iTunes is able to see, hey, people are engaged with this. People like this enough to take a moment and write something about it. So it really does make a difference. And we really appreciate getting to hear what it is you get out of this show. Um, in particular, I've loved how our reviews were actually the first thing that kind of made us realize that there were people who were in a variety of relationships, who are in monogamous relationships, or who are relationship therapists who are using the things that we talk about on this show with their clients. Um, like Those things are amazing, and we wouldn't have known that if people hadn't left those reviews. So if you haven't done it yet, we would love it so much if you just took a moment, again, to go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Stitcher and write us a review and let us know what it is you like about this show. Why do you listen to it? Why is this worth someone taking an hour of their time each week to listen to? Uh, and we would appreciate that so, so much. And I look forward to reading them and probably getting teared up while doing so. Yeah. Uh, shall I move us along to the next one? Uh, sure. Yeah. 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 Let's go on, please. So the next one is holding the relationship hostage. And I think this one is tricky because basically, so when it's I... It's like, give me all the wedding rings or this relationship gets it. <laughs> all of the wedding rings. Everybody's oh, wedding man. rings. Uh, <laughs> wow. Okay, because this can be things like threatening to leave if your partner doesn't shape up or threatening 
to, I don't know, de-escalate or threatening to move out or threatening to divorce or whatever. And I think the reason why this gets so tricky is because this can bump up against having healthy boundaries, I think. Just, yeah. Because that's the thing I that... Yeah. I think we were all sitting here waiting. 100%. Like, ooh, ooh, I've got, I've got one about that. That's yeah. what everyone gets so know, confused. It's a, it's a little... It's, it's on yes, a razor's edge. It's so tricky because... On the one hand, you know, it could be like, okay, well, my partner is lying to me all the time about all these things. I keep catching him in lies. Um, And my boundary might be, I can't be in a relationship with someone who lies to me all the time. And that's true. And again, Mm -hmm. you'll have to go back, listen to our episode on the basics of boundaries. We go into this conversation much more in depth. Um, But like me saying, I can't be in a relationship with someone who lies to me all the time sounds very similar to, hey, if you don't stop lying, I'm going to leave. Yeah. Or I'm I or I'm gonna have to step out of this relationship, and I think that's why this gets a little bit tricky. Sorry, I I really got to jump in on this one because I just I actually just had a conversation with my sister about this. My sister is is incredibly mm. intelligent, and I respect her a ton. And if she were comfortable with me naming her on this, I totally would because I think she's a great person who a lot of people could stand to learn a ton of things from. But we were having this conversation about boundaries and. Um, one of the things that that we were talking about this and how difficult it is where sometimes, you know, even when you try to say it in the nicest way possible of like, look, if this doesn't change, I have to make a different decision. Mm. And what she said that I thought was really intelligent was boundaries sound like threats to people who don't want to hear them. Hmm, um, interesting. Which I, I don't think hmm. is the entire story, but I think it's I think it explains a lot of the miscommunication where it's like all I can do is all I can do is tell you where I am. And sometimes I and maybe I have yeah. to tell you where I am is I can't keep doing this. Hmm. Um and that can sound like a threat. So like how does one handle that? If I if I may, I'm gonna you take may. this in a direction <laughs> maybe a little weird, but to take it to some stuff that's taught about parenting. And one of the things, one of the principles in parenting is something that can, can quickly cause a problem in your relationship with your child is essentially making empty threats. Hmm. Is that like, you know, you have to clean your room or like come here right hmm. now or stop hmm. screaming or whatever it is, or else this, or else, you know, like you don't get ice cream today. But then once you're at the ice cream place later, it's like, well, Okay. And then you just lose all your credibility. And I would say that actually this difference between like essentially blackmailing the relationship or, Mm. or holding it hostage versus on the other hand, having a boundary is partly that is that a a personal boundary isn't something where it's like, (laughs) you know, a boundary isn't generally phrased like, well, I I'm not okay with being in a relationship with someone who continually lies to me for more than several years, then I'll, you know, that's not a situation I'll be in, but instead it's like, no, I'm not okay with being in a relationship where someone lies to me. And so if that's actually what's happening, yeah. then you actually do remove yourself from that situation. Whereas the holding it hostage could still come from a good place of wanting to protect yourself, or it could come from a place of wanting to control them, but it's using it as a threat. Mm-hmm. rather than actually mm-hmm. like, I'm going to do this, even though it's hard because I need to take care of myself mm-hmm. versus I'm saying this to you to try to get your behavior to change. Do you see that? Like the kind of what I'm getting at with the difference there? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I really ran up against this the last time I found myself enforcing a boundary, which mm-hmm. we're not going to get into that story here and now. Um, Great. But I did really run up against like how difficult this was because it's like, okay, I expressed this boundary to this person of kind of like, hey, if this is happening, like I can't be in this kind of relationship. And then I'm like, but the thing is in expressing that, like I really do hope that by expressing that boundary, this person chooses to change their behavior. It's like, I really do hope that. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But then, but then the next step being they don't, or they're like, well, no, I'm not going to make a different decision. And then I have to follow through with like, okay, Mm -hmm. then I need to step out, you know, versus trying to like rephrase that boundary or trying to tweak it or change it or do whatever I can to be like, well, if I say it this way, or if I threaten this, or if I do that, then may, then will you change your behavior? Then will you make a different decision? Um, That's where you get into the concession creep is what Dedeker likes to call it. Yeah. No, I think you made the right decision in that scenario, Um, but but I, I guess it's, it also comes down to kind of like, what is the goal of you expressing this boundary? how are you enforcing it? Because again, if the enforcement becomes more 
more about like, I'm going to try to enforce this so that they change their behavior as opposed to I'm going to try to enforce this so that I can stay protected. It does get a little bit sticky. That mm-hmm. is, yeah, it's mm-hmm. it, that, that is where it, it does come down a little bit to intention and like mm-hmm. what it is you're actually trying to do with these things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, and just for those of you out there who want a deeper dive into boundaries, that is episode 178 of Multiamory this podcast you're listening to. So go back to episode 178. <laughs> and, in case you didn't know, welcome to In case you yeah. forgot. You're like, where am I? What yeah. am I doing? Yeah. Okay, should we move uh, on? Yeah, let's go on to the next one here. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the fifth toxic, destructive thing that one can do in relationships, and that is dropping hints and other passive-aggressive forms of communication. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Passive aggressive forms of communication. Yeah. I mean, this, I feel it goes back to the mind reading thing that we were talking about a little bit earlier. Mm. This idea that like, if my partner really cares about me, they'll just know what I want or they'll know why I'm upset. And so that's why, that's what I think leads to this sort of passive aggressive, like, well, if they don't know, I'm not going to tell them they need to figure it out. That's like part of the punishment, Mm -hmm. I think. And that's, Like, again, to come back to the fact that this is so normal because we see it in all our media, this is the plot of literally every sitcom ever and every rom-com ever will have something like this. But especially sitcoms about like existing families, this is every episode all the time. Can I just say this is interesting because I I just read what Mark Manson said about Mm -hmm. this. And in addition to saying like, okay, instead of stating a desire or thought overtly, your partner tries to nudge you in the right direction of figuring it out for yourself. But then the next thing that he said that's related to this is instead of saying what's actually upsetting you, you find small and petty ways to piss off your partner so that then they'll feel you'll feel justified in complaining to them. That's interesting. That's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. I, I mean... This just brings back a lot of just uncomfortable memories of like my early relationship days in my young adulthood is basically all that's coming up for me right now. Because I think, I don't know, it's um, the household that I grew up in. I don't know if I necessarily would want to say that it was like a super passive aggressive household, but it was definitely not a household of direct communication about things Mm. or working things out. Um, And I think I also came into a lot of my adult relationships having a sense of like, any kind of direct communication is is probably bad and indicates there's probably going to be a problem. So it's best to just kind of tiptoe around it and hope that your partner gets yeah, the point. Yeah, that's an interesting yeah. idea. It is the tiptoe yeah. idea that like that's the better option than just being like, hey, yeah. you did this thing and I didn't like it. So let's talk about it. It is, it is so something. funny how stuff that for us now and like what we talk about on this show is just like, Yes, if you can directly communicate about something, that's 100% like the best thing to do, you know, the the fastest path to get to understanding. But that belief right there is the opposite of what most of us are kind of brought up to think we do in relationships. It's not the example we're given in our TV shows and our movies or probably most of our parents, too. That's true. Yeah. I feel I feel kind of like um, I'm just thinking back on my own experience. Um I feel like I, I haven't had a lot of experience with passive aggressive behavior in relationships, which kind of says to me, it's kind of like that thing where if like, if you don't know who the idiot or the creep is in your group of friends, it's you. Um, <laughs> so um, and so, so you're the passive aggressive like, yeah, one. Yeah, which is not yeah. necessarily true. And so I'm like, I don't know. I haven't really been in many passive aggressive relationships. I'm like, ah, oh, shit. Maybe it's me. <laughs> so I'm thinking back and I, I'm, I'm realizing that I might have done some passive aggressive stuff and. So, I mean, certainly not intended to, but actually done it with really good intentions. And it was it was specifically about jealousy. Um, yeah. Like what are good intentions with passive well, aggressiveness? It's, funny. it's like and this maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm I'm equating apples to oranges here. But I remember trying to talk to a, to a partner who was newer to, to polyamory and open relationships than I was and trying to talk to them about jealousy. And I was sort of I, I had done a lot of my own work on jealousy. So I felt like I was on kind of the quote unquote other side of it. You're never on the other side, but you, you get it managed. So I had my shit managed and I was kind of talking about, this is some of the ideology, the philos- the f- philosophy, the philosophy, <laughs> um, you know, this is, this is, these are some of the principles that guide it. Um, and I think that like, 
a very, very quiet part of the back of my brain, maybe that I wasn't even fully conscious of, was like, maybe once I tell you this, you'll kind of like, maybe this will click for you, which is a little bit passive aggressive mm. as opposed to being mm. like, I wish you were more this way, which is just aggressive and not good. <laughs> right. Um, but what I, and you know, I was just trying to talk about it, but I didn't realize that in doing it, I was actually like doing violence to my partner and they came back to me and they were like, I mm. feel so inadequate and less than because I don't feel the way you described. Mm. Therefore I feel like a failure. Huh. Um, and so wow. like it was a really insidious form of being passive aggressive because I really thought I was I thought I was helping. Hmm. I really thought I was doing the right thing. Huh. That's really interesting because I do feel like a lot of these some some of these things I think can come from a place of good intentions and I think and like we often say on this show a lot of these things can be unintentionally weaponized, you know. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I mean a lot of a lot of healthy behaviors can easily be tweaked into being weaponized. Yeah. Yes. So it's not just like a blanket. This is exactly the piece that makes it good or bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of a study of economics thing where like, if you incentivize a certain behavior, you have to understand that you also perversely incentivize whatever, like, or I'm sorry. Yeah. If you incentivize a behavior with a goal, you have to understand that you're also incentivizing other behaviors that get you to that goal. You know, so like if you're in sales and you incentivize closing a certain number of sales, you might de-incentivize being an ethical salesperson. Uh, I right. see. So you've right. got to understand mm. like if Absolutely. this is the goal Gosh. and people are hitting it, are they hitting it the right way or are they suddenly doing something that's way off base but working? But, but is working to get reach that goal. How many credit cards could I get at Banana Republic? <laughs> oh, gosh. I was the best credit card yeah. salesman. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Like one of the best in Los Angeles, but like, is it ethical to get people to get credit cards that maybe they're going to rack up bills and, and debt? No. Yeah. It's, it's gosh, as now I just want to go on like tangents about like incentivizing and de-incentivizing and all of that, but uh, yeah. I'll try to try to keep this on topic here. <laughs> Well, capitalism, man. Well, okay, let's know. bring it back to but communication yeah, yeah. though. Different episode. Rather than getting <laughs> off track about capitalism. Um, multi Financery. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So what I definitely had to learn about myself when I was much more passive in my communication, we'd much more likely to drop hints and just not bring things up directly is part of it for me was, you know, the models that I saw growing up didn't really set me up for success. Mm. It combined with just a straight up fear of like, it doesn't feel safe to be direct with anyone. It wasn't even specific to the partner. I think at that time, you know, Interesting. It just doesn't feel safe at all, um, and it doesn't feel safe to be honest. Because, because why? Um, again, because I think I grew up in a sense where it just, you know, in a family where just it wasn't safe to directly communicate, and then combined with I think just all of our cultural baggage around it not being safe to be radically honest or directly communicate with and people. And by not safe, you mean like that they would just like get in a huff about it or that they or, would yell back at you or, or in my head that was going to happen or it would make me look bad or I would look too vulnerable or be too mm. embarrassed about communicating my needs directly or would seem too needy or like whatever mm. a billion different reasons to justify me being passive in my communication. Um, but I definitely had to learn some hacks around communicating, you know, like I had to learn like, okay, if I sit down and if I like, write something out ahead of time that makes it a little bit easier for me to communicate directly about something. Or if I agree with my partner, like, Hey, there's something I want to talk about. That's really vulnerable. Could we like actually chat with each other, like via text about it? I know that's not ideal, but mm -hmm. like, can we try that? Because it feels mm -hmm. safer for me to talk about it there. And, and then we try that. And little by little, it's, I kind of had to ease myself into this more direct communication, but I kind of had to do it in, via arenas that felt safe at first, at least. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that you hit on in there repeatedly, and I think this is like an area where I know I feel like I can develop in this communication wise is I think another reason that people feel like they need to be passive aggressive and whatever is I think, uh, I've said, I think like seven times, but whatever, um, <laughs> they're still, uh, they're focusing on how they want the other person to change rather than going, what's my response? What am I feeling and not feeling safe communicating in sort mm -hmm. of an, ownership of their own experience way. Um, you know, people, people get passive aggressive. It's, it's really the intention of passive aggressive behavior is to get the other person to change. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and it sort of betrays a fundamental misunderstanding of what's causing the emotions within you within right. the person i mean that's the truth for a lot of yeah. these yeah definitely yeah. O- own your shit right yeah i found like for, yeah. for me with dedeker's example of let's maybe do this in a different format like for me it was often i need to write down all the things i want to say beforehand and then even though we're talking in person mm. it's like i have something to reference because otherwise in the moment i'm going to be like huh okay yeah that, that's all that's good enough you know because I'm, I'm too freaked out <laughs> well to- and you also <laughs> you also might get emotional in a sense that kind of betrays what you actually want to say. Like, yeah, it may come off as much more intense or angry or whatever, just simply because like, if you don't know what you're saying, you know, you could get really upset in the moment and that could cause your partner to believe something else than what you're actually trying Mm -hmm. to convey. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That's a t- it is tough. It's but communication is key. Clearly, so I want to move us on to the last of these six here, and this is the relationship scorecard or keeping score. Oh boy! Oh boy! Yeah, boy! Oh boy! Um, oh yeah! Oh so yeah! Well, this... you know the Bible says that love does not keep a record of wrongs. It it does. Does it? I haven't gotten there yet. Spoilers. That's <laughs> it's usually paraphrased as love doesn't keep score, uh-huh. um, but yeah, it's um. So what are we talking about? We're talking about this idea of like, you made a mistake once and I'm going to use that against you whenever, right? That's like on your permanent record. Right. (laughs) Or on the other hand, I think it could be like some of these examples we talked about before with buying your way out of things of that, like, well, Mm -hmm. no, but I did this one really good thing for you. So like I'm up on the Mm -hmm. scoreboard. So you owe me. Yeah. It it can, it can also be a symptom of, of what about ism. So this idea of like, if my partner calls out something in me, then I can be like, well, what about that time that you did yeah. yada, 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 yada? Or like, what about the time yeah, that you did oh, that totally, same totally. thing? And it's again, like deflecting. okay, I think this one can get really insidious and tricky because of the fact that maybe there have been some systemic issues or repeating issues in your relationship. And sometimes it might be like, hey, I'm having a hard time trusting you with X, Y, and Z because of some things that happened in the past. And on the one hand, it's like, yeah, that's totally valid. Like you can have a lot of trauma around stuff that's happened in the past with your partner that maybe still hurts. And it's kind of figuring out what's the difference between that of like, hey, there's some past influences that are still holding me back and I don't feel are healed and is kind of preventing me from feeling like I can trust you versus what is, here's the scorecard and you currently uh, are in the negatives. And so therefore I can't reward you with my trust. Does that make sense? Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, what you were just saying is kind of, I was writing a note over here thinking of the same thing because I mean, Jace, I think you hit the nail on the head. There's the two sides of it. There's keeping track of what they've done wrong and keeping track of what I've done. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, or, or vice versa. If you have like a low self image thing and you're like, Oh, they're always doing this. They do all of that. I suck. I suck. I'm not worthy. I'm talking Mm -hmm. myself. That's a a good example. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, it really brought up for me this idea at first of like, really the, the, I think that a, a big portion of healing the, um, the scorecard of what your partner has done wrong is forgiveness. And I brought up the question, what is forgiveness really? And this is something that I've struggled with in my Mm. relationships, frankly, of being the one forgiven because like I fucked up, I fucked up plenty and I fucked up bad. Um, sorry, hopefully not too much swearing, but (laughs) family program. We can swear. Totally fine. Sweet. So, um, yeah, that's a tough one. And also feeling it at times like, oh, I'm I'm fucking up all the time. I'm the one who, you know, keeps getting called out in various ways. Like, what is that exactly? Is that just because, you know, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy or I'm essentially, you know, remembering the times in which my partner is calling me out or do I really need to look at something mm-hmm. that is, you know, continuing to be a pattern in our relationship? It's challenging. Like the scorecard can come from many different places. I think especially if you have a combination of someone who does tend to blame themselves with someone who likes to keep yeah. score of all the things you did wrong, right? That that those two together <laughs> can really cause, you know, can, can be that times 10, right? Yeah, because definitely. now you're both totally. tipping the scales even worse in this way and both reinforcing this idea of the scorecard. Yeah. If, uh, and, and, um, 
I just want to, sorry, I just want to wrap up one other thing because I don't want to make it sound like in, on that subject of forgiveness, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, if your partner has had a, like a series or a history of a certain behavior, um, I don't believe that forgiveness and forgetting are the same thing. Mm -hmm. You can, um, to me, Mm -hmm. forgiveness is, is saying, you know what, this is what happened and I just fully accept it. I, I, my anger, my resentment, whatever feeling I have about it won't change it. It's forgiveness is like, if you're holding a hot rock, it, you know, it's going to burn you no matter what Mm -hmm. you drop the rock, that's forgiveness, but it doesn't mean you're going to go pick up the rock again. Mm. Um, and so Mm. that's sort of the, the, the flip side is forgive. Absolutely. But certainly don't forget. Well, it's interesting because I don't think forgiveness is uh, uh, very valued in our culture right now, honestly, on yeah. a wider scale. But that can be that can be another topic for another time. I wanted to read this example, actually, that Mark put in this original blog post here. And I think this kind of captures some of some of the nuance that it's not quite just so like, well, you did all these things wrong. But so this is the example is. You were an asshole at Cynthia's 28th birthday party back in 2010, and it has proceeded to ruin your life ever since. Why? Because there's not a week that goes by that you're not reminded of it. Mm. But that's okay, because that time you caught her sending flirtatious text messages to her coworker immediately removes her right to get jealous. So it's kind of even, right? It's that too, where it's, you know, sometimes it's just like one person trying to pile up all the things one person did wrong, but the other is like, well, but now I can do something shitty to them or like they can't be upset at me for a thing because they did something. It's like another way of trying to balance the scales. So it's, it's like the two wrongs making a right mm-hmm. it's, yeah. Yeah. situation. I yeah. balance the scales by being shitty too yeah. and right. now equally shitty people. Right. 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 And yeah. I, I, um, I liked this last quote here too. He says, um, in just sort of like what you should do instead of this, he says, you should recognize that by choosing to be with your significant other, you're choosing to be with all of their prior actions and behaviors. If you don't accept those, then ultimately you're not accepting them. Hmm. And I think that's great. And I also think that, that if you're not accepting them and their past behaviors, that is also okay. But then just like own up to the fact that you're just not accepting them and don't be in that relationship. Mm. So like, I don't want people to think that that means like, oh no, you can't just ever be upset about anything. It's like, no, if it really is like, I can't get over this thing you did in the past, then yeah, then maybe then you can't be be with them them because you don't accept them. Well, I feel like, okay, either, either yes, either it's, you can't be with them or that's an indicator of like, we have some work to do, like serious work to do. Like we need to get into counseling or, or we really need to proactively work to repair this. Um, but again, I think that that takes some analysis and some self-awareness to know like, okay, if this person did this thing in the past or a number of these things in the past, like, is this something I can see myself repairing? Do I want to repair it? Because I've definitely been in situations where sometimes it's a little powerful to feel like your partner made all these fuck ups and you're the good one and you can kind of hold that over (laughs) them and like kind of always bring that up. God, you know, like sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I think we can go into these things and not actually want it to be repaired because Mm. there's a little bit of power there. For sure. A hundred percent. I can identify with that. It's really uncomfortable to be able to recognize that, but it is definitely possible. Yeah. So this, this has been a cool discussion of all these things. I love this stuff. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Mark Manson's writing. I definitely recommend checking out some of his stuff at markmanson.net. Um, and then also thank you so much to Ben for joining us and talking about all this. Thank you for sharing vulnerably about your own experiences. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I hope I was able to contribute in a way that made an impact on someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. And if people want to know more about yeah, you. So if anyone listened to all that and was like, that's all fine and good, but I wanted to know more about the side hustle coaching. <laughs> <laughs> like that was really what I came here for. I was hoping it would be that episode. <laughs> uh, well, you can have that episode one-on-one with me. Uh, <laughs> Um, so my web address is peace through progress coaching.com. That's peace P E A C E through T H R U G H the whole word, not abbreviated progress coaching. If you can't spell those, then I can't help you at this point.com peace through progress coaching.com. Just send, send me a direct contact there. There's a survey you can take that just so I can get to know you a little bit better. But if you just shoot me an email, that's the fastest way to get in touch with me. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm here to help you make your dreams come true and live the life that you want. So um, I'd love to work with anyone who's interested. And I think you're a great community because you're, you know, you're, you're following some great leaders in your field. Um, 
And, uh, and I'm sorry for any horrible tapping sounds. I hit the table a lot when I talk. So you're probably like, sorry, Mauricio. Someone's going to hear that. Um, yeah. And just thanks. Thanks for all of your uh, attention and effort. Yeah. So we would love to hear from you. What did you think of these of this list? Are there other behaviors that you can think of? Do you totally disagree with the way that we've <laughs> come down on some of these issues? Can you think of other examples where maybe some of these behaviors are less toxic or maybe helpful? We would definitely love to hear from you. So the best place to share your thoughts with other listeners is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook group or Discord chat. You can get access to these groups and you can join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com. You can leave us a voicemail at 678-M-U-L-T-I-0-5. Or you can leave us a voice message on Facebook. Multiamory is created and produced by Emily Matlack, Jace Lindgren, and me, Dedeker Winston. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanera. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our production assistant is Nicole Samra. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. Hey, this is Dan Savage from the Savage Lovecast and Savage Love. You're listening to a Swing Set podcast at Swing Set FM. Mm-hmm.